So this is the last uh, last two lectures, um, and uh, so I haven't given uh, any references really. But uh, since this is what I'm talking about now, are things that I'm 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 working on. Uh, uh, let me just give some. These are some some uh, abstract uh, some archive papers, and then the sort of classic reference for spin geometry is the uh, the two volume book by Penrose and Rindler, and and that I can I cannot recommend that more highly, so to speak, um, uh, and and you can study it uh, for, for a long time, and it will still contain uh, new things. <coughs> and, um, and so in these, I just realized I messed up the convention. So this, uh, what we, in this paper, uh, uh, these, uh, these fundamental operators were used, and also uh, one of these is joined with Jeremy, who will explain everything this evening. I heard. <laughs> so one one of these papers is with uh, is with Jeremy, and there these operators also uh, appear. And uh, so this curl dagger is the what I called curl yesterday. Uh, so that's the convention. So so the curl dagger. Uh, on, on phi equal to zero, that that's the Maxwell equation, uh, and and so we're we're talking about mostly about type D spaces, and there we have uh, a killing spinner cap A B, which was Z uh, uh, O A I B. Uh, and and the, the this this zeta is is proportional to psi two to the minus one third, and psi two is the is the one remaining curvature scalar in this setting. Uh, and and uh, and in that in in that case, if we're also assuming vacuum, then the divergence. Uh, is a, this is a killing vector field. So whenever you have a killing spinner, so, so that means that in particular that, that, uh, that any vacuum type D space time has a killing field. And in fact, they have two killing fields. Uh, and, and so this, this, this is in the, in the background. Um, uh, and and so just just to uh, so as I said so so type D this this is uh, this family can be classified ha has been classified uh, and it contains the Kerr Kernot and C metrics as examples and um, and there is a particular subclass so in general this is a complex uh, killing vector field but if if psi is 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 proportional to a real uh, killing vector field. This is this is called the the the, the generalized Kernot, and this is kind of the, the good class because uh, then we can make this real, and I can I can define a a a, a, a two tensor. Uh, Like that. So, so the, uh, sorry. Uh, so this is the imaginary part. 
So I, I, I suppose that kappa has this property that, that psi is real. I take the imaginary part. This then is, is a, what's known as a killing Yano tensor. So it's a skew two tensor which satisfies this equation. And if I square that, this gives me a symmetric two tensor. And uh, that's, that satisfies the killing tensor equation. So this is, this is, uh, this is where Carter's This is Carter's symmetric killing tensor. And you have it whenever you're in this generalized Carnot class. And you have it only there. So this is somehow the, the right class to think about. And in that class, the Kerr space time uh, is the one that's asymptotically flat and has, has non-zero mass or positive mass. So, that, that's a, so there, in, in this context, I don't have time to go into that. There is, there is a machine that allows you to characterize uh, Kerr space times. And, and you can do that at the Cauchy data level by this uh, killing, initial, killing spinner initial data construction, which is analogous to, um, to the killing initial data uh, that I mentioned, uh, I think, in the first lecture. <coughs> OK, and I, so I messed up on, on a couple of other sign conventions and so on, but uh, Jeremy will, <laughs> will take care of that, I hope. Uh, OK, so, so, we had, um, uh, so we had this. Uh, so we have a complex null. Uh, uh, so, so we're now in the in the setting where we have uh, uh, so we have the spin diod uh, and and that gives a, a null tetrad L N M N bar by simply taking tensor products of these. Uh, and their complex conjugates. Uh, and uh, if we project on, on the, uh, we project the, the, the covariant derivative on the tetrad or on the dyad, that gives the spin coefficients. Uh, and, and so let me, let me not write all of them down, but just uh, just one or two. So that's one of them. And this is equal to minus theta plus i omega. And theta is this expansion that I had on the board earlier. And omega is the twist. So this is the, the complex divergence. Uh, and uh, and so there are, and uh, so I mentioned I mentioned uh, so so we have so there's a list of these uh, uh, so there are six of these up to uh, so so there are six of these and I'm not going to take time to write them all down. There are six of these up to, to uh, the prime operation. And uh, so I said that yesterday. So this switches L and N and M and M bar and complex conjugate. And, and uh, as we'll see, so those, so there are four which are, uh, are distinguished. And so they, together with their primes, and, uh, uh, make up eight uh, scalars. And 
these together with their primes make up uh, four scalars and and uh, and these these are are the, these two so let me write one of them uh, So, so that's a, that's an example of of the expression for this beta, uh, and uh, epsilon is is similar, but those have a different nature, uh, and and I'll I'll say something about this uh, in a moment, uh, and uh, so I also explained that that the psi this goes over to a collection psi i of scalars i goes from 0 up to 4. Uh, the, the Maxwell spinner goes over to a collection of scalars phi i. i goes from 0, 1, and 2. <coughs> um, and uh, a very important, and so, so now I'm, I'm introducing these, uh, these tetrad coefficient, tetrad components of the fields. And I mean, uh, I, I mean, I would like to avoid that because really uh, everything is, everything should be encoded in terms of the killing spinner. Once you know the killing spinner, you actually know all of these structures because in a, in a type D space time, uh, what, we, what we're supposed to do is, is to Look at uh, at at uh, so in in the type D space time uh, we have the principal uh, diode and that sits inside the killing spinner so so the so the the kappa that knows about the principal diode which is that and and that also knows about the principal tetrad, right? So so uh, once you have once you once you're in type D, you have the killing spinner, and that sort of encodes the information about the principal null directions of the vial vial tensor, and and uh, and it's it's. It's a convenience to 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 go this further step and project everything on the on the tetrad, uh, and the reason is that uh, we understand uh, how to do how to work covariantly with the Maxwell field, but linearized gravity is more di more complicated and more difficult. Um, and and I wanted to say something uh, about the Tukolsky system, uh, and uh, I don't know yet how to do that in a completely covariant manner. <coughs> okay. Uh, and and uh, so uh, 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 an important, so this is, so one, one important simpli simplification is to, uh, you project on the tetrad, you, 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 you get rid of a lot of repetition by working modulo these symmetry operations. Uh, and there is another symmetry operation, which is called the star operation. So that sends L to M, N to minus M bar, M to minus L, M bar to N. And uh, so these are, are symmetry operations in the sense that the, if you apply this operation to an equation in the in this formalism uh, the equation still remains true so this is so bo so all of these have that property so basically you can you can cut down the number of equations that you need to work with quite drastically by 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 only working up to sort of modulo these uh, these operations uh, and 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 so, for example, uh, you have that psi i prime is minus psi 
4 minus i, uh, psi i star is psi i, and so on. And there are similar properties for the Maxwell. Uh, now, uh, so uh, so if we do a rescaling, so remember that that there is a normalization. This is a, an orthonormal tetrad. So so L a n a is equal to uh, minus m a m bar a, which is one. Uh, and and there is another normalization for the dyad, which is that. And uh, so I can preserve this these normalizations, even if I rescale. So the, that fixes these these null vectors uh, only up to some rescaling. And so I can send the omicron to lambda times itself and iota to lambda inverse times itself. This, this, uh, and, and lambda here is a complex valued function on space time. And this will still preserve those, uh, those uh, normalizations. <coughs> and, uh, and so if you think about, you take a tensor or a spinner, that's, that's an unweighted object that, that has, that doesn't know about these rescalings. But once you project it on the, on the tetrad or the dyad, uh, uh, the, the fields pick up a weighting uh, uh, if you allow your, 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 uh, your, <coughs> your dyad or tetrad to be rescaled. And so this, this introduces the notion of weighted scalars. So uh, a weighted scalar is, is one that, when you apply such a rescaling, uh, has this property. And, and, and p and q are some integers. Uh, and this is, the, this is the type. And this is, this is all goes back to uh, the, the so-called GHP formalism, Gerog held Penrose formalism. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so for example, uh, if you let B be a half P plus Q, this is the boost weight. And the spin weight is P minus Q, a half P minus Q. And so the boost has to do with the rescaling of of, of L and N, so uh, so if I if I apply such a rescaling, then what will happen is that the 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 length of L will be rescaled, and correspondingly the N will be rescaled. So this is just applying a boost in this in this Lorentzian two plane that's spanned by by those vectors. <coughs> uh, Okay, and so, so what you find is that, uh, so these, these are called properly weighted fields. Uh, so those are called properly weighted. Uh, and what you find is that uh, of all these fields that you construct, the psi i, the phi i, uh, the rho, tau, kappa, sigma, they're all properly weighted. And the epsilon and beta, those are the bad guys, they are not properly weighted. And the reason is that, uh, that uh, these are actually uh, connection forms in a certain sense. I mean, all of, this, all of these are components of the spin connection. But these are connection forms. They, they build up a connection form on a complex line bundle. Uh, because uh, properly weighted fields, these are, these are uh, sections 
of C star, uh, so I mean a, a line bundle where the, the, the principal bundle is, uh, is the invertible complex numbers. And uh, so in, if you look at it from that context, once you introduce a, a, a dyad or a tetrad, uh, spinner fields go over to collections of sections of such, uh, such line bundles indexed by the type. Okay? And, uh, and, and on, on, on those line bundles, the Levitivita connection lifts So there is a certain lift of the Levitivita connection uh, that acts on these bundles, and 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 those those two uh, go into defining the connection form or the the, the connection coefficients here, right? So if if you're really following this philosophy, then then what you should do is you should encode everything in terms of, uh, in terms of these, uh, these uh, sections of line bundles and also in terms of that connection theta. And uh, so uh, that means that you should project, um, now uh, to write down the differential equations, you should project uh, on the tetrad and use that connection. And that gives the, the GHP operators. And, and so they're called in this funny way. Uh, so so I'm, I'm just going to write down uh, two of them. Uh, so these are, are the, the, the GHP operators, Thorn and F. And uh, they have naturally prime counterparts, which are got by applying the prime uh, operation. Okay, so, so now uh, the, the game is to write all the field equations in terms of these uh, fields that we have on the board, hiding these, these not properly weighted fields, uh, beta and epsilon will be uh, encoded into the this uh, connection theta, and uh, and then you end up with with uh, some substantial collection of, of equations, uh, and it's uh, to organize things. It's it's very important to uh, to think about the following fact. So uh, so here is the here is the P Q plane. So here, um, so if I list the types of these fields, here at the origin of uh, type 0, 0, uh, the, here is phi 1 and psi 2. Here is, here is uh, phi 0, uh, psi 1. Uh, out here is psi 0. I hope I get this right. Uh, so here is phi 2, uh, psi 3, and out here is psi 4. And these operators, because of the fact that uh, in the definition of L, for example, that has omicron, omicron bar. So that, has, that picks up a weight uh, lambda, lambda bar. So the type of L is going to be 1, 1. And that, that means that this operator here is weighted in the sense that if I apply it to some field which is properly weighted, I get uh, another field which is properly weighted but with different type. And, and so the, the scheme is like this, that Thorn, for example, goes, uh, this has 
as uh, as weight one one uh, As, as uh, weight min one minus one, and here is f prime, and here is thorn prime. Okay, so so this these facts you can use to organize uh, uh, your life because uh, if if we take the the big unweighted system of the Ricci equation, the, the first structure equation, second structure equation, and, and the Bianchi system, and we project on these tetrads or dyads, then uh, each equation that results is going to be a scalar equation. And all the terms in, the, in those equations have to have the same weight. And, uh, and, and, and th so that, uh, that, uh, that's uh, an important organizing principle. Um, and so I'm just going to write uh, a couple of equations uh, to see to see what's going on. So there is there is the Ricci system, uh, which is the first structure equation, and 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 that I'm not going to write down. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, this this is the the second. But if we write the Bianchi, uh, so uh, let me just write that uh, just to just to get an impression what's what's going on. So this is Bianchi up to plus prime and star versions of those equations. Okay, and, and Maxwell is this Like that. <clears throat> so, uh, and, and this is also uh, up to prime and star versions of those equations. So, so Maxwell uh, becomes four complex scalar equations. Bianchi b becomes a bunch of, of them, and then there is another bunch uh, of Ricci equations, which I haven't written down. Uh, but so this is to s depending on your computational ability, uh, this is manageable. But uh, this is I, I'm not saying this is manageable from my perspective, but uh, but it can be done. Okay, and then and then you also have comm commutator formulas. For let's say you have, an, uh, you can calculate an identity for, thorn, for the bracket of thorn and thorn prime and so on. Okay, so 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 that all that's all manageable. Uh, and now you see here that that uh, if we're in a type D space time, then uh, as I said yesterday, so so then, psi one is zero. Uh, kappa is zero, uh, sigma is zero, psi three is zero, psi zero is zero. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of simplification uh, in in the, in the type D case. Because because of all these fields that are that are simply zero. And if we look at now, if we want to understand linearized gravity in this context, 
then uh, so then we have some some uh, some parameter dependent uh, some one parameter family of metrics, and we differentiate all the fields along this uh, family of metrics, and uh, and we restrict to the background which is then assumed to be a type D space time. And that gives a collection of fields which are uh, linearized uh, spin coefficients, uh, linearized curvature scalars, and so on. Okay? And, uh, and uh, now if, if, if a field for uh, zero uh, for fields uh, uh, vanishing in background, then there is no coordinate gauge dependence. So those those are, are uh, gauge invariant with respect to coordinate gauge at the linearized level. Uh, but, but it's important to, to note that in, in general here we also have a tetrad, and there is a tetrad gauge because the tetrad can be, uh, be rotated. If you uh, perturb the tetrad, you want, some of those perturbations are simply rotations of, of sort of Lorentz rotations of the tetrad. So, so there is tetrad gauge. But for example, if we look at the linearized curvature scalars, then we have that psi zero dot psi four dot. So in, in a type D background, psi zero, psi one are zero, and psi zero uh, and also psi three and psi four are zero. So these these are actually gauge invariant fields. They they have no even if you rotate the tetrad or change the coordinates at the linearized level. These are gauge independent. And similarly, uh, psi 1 dot, psi 3 dot, those have pure tetrad gauge dependence. And psi 2 dot has only coordinate. So, so this, this kind of sort, sort things out. And since these are gauge independent fields, they seem to be uh, favorable in, in a certain sense. Uh, of course, they're, they're not true scalars. They're weighted scalars. And they're also, I mean, they're they have both, uh, uh, they, in particular, they have spin weight. So, so, so that means that, uh, that um, uh, they are not scalars in the true sense of the word that we're used to thinking of. <coughs> um, okay, let's see here. Okay, so, so, um, So I wanted to uh, introduce now the Tucholsky system, uh, which is uh, is a wave equation for these uh, extreme scalars. So so these are the these are the ones with uh, extreme spin weight, uh, and in in the Maxwell case, the the phi zero and phi two are the ones with extreme uh, spin weight. And now, in the, for, for Maxwell, uh, the, those, are, those scalars are got by projecting uh, the, the Maxwell um, field strength on the, on the tetrad or the diode. And the Maxwell field strength is gauge invariant. I mean, the, the gauge there is, 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 is simply these uh, complex phase rotations. And, and the field strength is, is, uh, is, is gauge invariant. So 
in the Maxwell case, there is no gauge issue. So there, uh, things are, are a lot simpler. And, and you see that also from here, that there's the, the system of equations, uh, when you predict, is, is that much simpler. <clears throat> so, uh, so the Tucholsky system This is a, a wave equation for psi 0, psi 4 linearized, or, or phi 0, phi 2. And, uh, and where this comes from, <coughs> this, uh, this, uh, wh where this comes from is really uh, the following. So you could, you could invent this without introducing all this, all this uh, machinery and simply by, by uh, calculating. And, and the way to do it is if we start with a Bianchi identity. And, and apply another derivative. This, this gives uh, a wave equation for curvature. And uh, well, uh, let me write it since I have it here. So this is the this is known as the Penrose wave equation, and th there is a corresponding uh, wave equation for uh, so uh, for for the for the field strength in Maxwell theory. So let me just write it uh, like this. So that's a that's a uh, just apply one derivative to the Maxwell equation and and commute derivatives. You pick up some curvature, and you get uh, this wave equation. So there are these two uh, wave equations for the field strength. So th here, I've, th here we have already used rich equal to zero. So, uh, so there are these two wave equations for, for this applies to the Weyl tensor and this applies to the, to the Maxwell field strength. And you simply take those, predict on the tetrad and calculate for a long time. You get, uh, you, you find that if you're in a type, you, if you linearize this then, around the type D background. You linearize this around the type, you apply this on a type D background, making use of the, of the fact that many spin coefficients and curvature components are zero. You find that uh, the scalars actually can be decoupled. <coughs> uh, and, and, uh, <coughs> and the system uh, that you end up with is can be written in this in the following form. <coughs> um, yeah. Ah, sorry. Yes. Uh, so I shouldn't have it. So, yeah. But I mean, it, it's basically it's box R equals something quadratic in R. And then you linearize this, and you get some other equation for the linearized curvature. And that miraculously simplifies in, in the following way that I'm going to say. <coughs> so uh, OK, so, so to introduce the Tukolsky system, uh, uh, so th this is a very, very sort of impressionistic, but uh, it, it, it can be written in the following covariant looking form. So introduce this.
So rho and tau are two of the, the spin coefficients, n and n bar are, are from the tetrad. So that defines a one form beta, uh, a one form b. And uh, now we can define a covariant derivative, which is theta minus p minus q. So we have to understand here that theta acts on weighted fields which have a particular pq type. And the, the, the p and q have to be then, uh, they, they will then depend on the, on the type of field that we apply this derivative to. Uh, and uh, let me define the Tucholsky wave operator uh, like this. And so th this, this will, in a natural way, be a, a metric covariant derivative because the metric is unweighted. So if I apply all of this to the metric, uh, then those guys vanish and the theta becomes just the ordinary Levi-Civita covariant derivative. So this is a metric uh, covariant derivative in the usual sense. But, but when we apply it to sections of these uh, line bundles, uh, then, then we have a modi modified connection. <coughs> okay, and, and uh, the, the Tukolsky uh, operator is so now, for we, we, we do this for a particular spin value of the spin of the field. Uh, and this is then, uh, so, so let me call this script, little script S. Uh, so this is a wave type operator. Okay. And, and here, this, this S is the spin of, of the field. So this, this, is S, uh, this S is, takes values 0, 1, and 2, depending on if you're, in, in for, you're doing a scalar wave equation, Maxwell, or linearized gravity. Okay. <coughs> so, so concretely, uh, the, 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 the equation for, for psi zero, for example, is uh, uh, sorry, um, right. And uh, if we look at the other, the other uh, field, which is in the, in the spin two case, this is this then picks up a rescaling by the factor zeta, which was proportional to, uh, to the negative cube root of, of psi 2. So this is, in, in Boyer-Lindquist coordinates, this is just uh, r minus ia cosine theta. So it, it's a factor that sort of scales up the field. And, and so, so these equations hold. So those are, those are wave type equations with some funny properties. Uh, <coughs> Yes, yes. So, so we take, we take uh, a type T space time, uh, linearize at, uh, on that background, and simply evaluate uh, the, the resulting equation. And so this, those equations are, as I said, morally speaking, they're projections of this big, the linearization of this big wave equation. Uh, and, and since this is got by taking a derivative of the Bianchi system, we can get the, the Tukolsky system also in this context. And this is how it was found um, uh, by taking the, the scalar 
decomposed version of the Bianchi system and applying one more derivative to that. We're taking the, the scalar decomposed Maxwell system and applying one more derivative to that. Um, so before um, so before saying uh, before so I, I, I want to derive uh, the Maxwell version of this uh, but before before doing that uh, I, I mean the, I, I won't derive the 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 linear gravity version of this uh, but it's similar. But before, before doing that, um, I want to mention another set of equations that are, uh, so, so for, for Maxwell, for the Maxwell case, what you have is, uh, is this, uh, so here S is one, so we have minus four psi two, and here we have phi zero equal to zero. And now I have zeta squared phi two equal to zero. So that's that's the Maxwell version of the Tukolsky system. <coughs> but uh, so before, uh, uh, okay. So I should leave this perhaps. No. So, uh, so before doing that, uh, I want to mention uh, one more thing, and that's spin lowering. So, uh, if if we if we look at at spin s, on Minkowski, So those are, are fields that satisfy an equation like this. So these are symmetric uh, spinners, and they satisfy an equation like this. Then if I have a killing spinner, so this is a valence two killing spinner on Minkowski. Or well, in, in general, if you have that and the killing spinner, then then uh, the field that you get uh, by taking the contraction of the the the, the spinner with the killing spinner, uh, this is a spin s minus one field. So uh, by contracting with a killing spinner, I lower the, the spin by one. And, and this, if I take this new field, plug it into the corresponding equation, I still get zero. So this, has, this, this operation lowers the spin. Uh, but this only works, uh, this only works in a, in a uh, this only works if we're in a, If we're in a conformally flat background, okay. But uh, in 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 a type D uh, space-time, this this is still useful because uh, if I define the field epsilon by phi a b, so now now we're in a type D. So if we define the field epsilon by taking the Maxwell field. Contracting with the killing spinner, which we always have in in the type D case, uh, then you can calculate that that field, which is which is uh, basically it's it's equal to uh, zeta times phi one. So this is a rescaled, this epsilon becomes a rescaled version 
of the middle, middle Maxwell scalar. Uh, and you can calculate that this, this satisfies this wave equation. And now the, the important point is that this, this, this epsilon is a true scalar. So it has, it, it has spin weight zero and boost weight zero. Uh, and, and this is known as the factorial Ipsilon equation. So that's another uh, equation that sort of encodes the Maxwell equation. Uh, those two equations encode the Maxwell equation. But this is another uh, scalar wave equation that encodes the Maxwell equation. And this has the, the principal part of that is just the ordinary wave equation. So that, from, from a certain point of view, seems, uh, seems more attractive. Uh, if you do the same procedure for, you do the ana analog procedure for linear gravity in, in, a, in, a, in a type D space, you end up with the following. Uh, expression uh, and now it's zeta squared psi 2 dot that's the field and here on the right hand side we have some uh, something like this Um, so this is the, on the right hand side here, we have the linearized uh, wave. So we take the, the wave operator and linearize it with respect to the metric. Here are background fields. This is the linearized Psi 2 uh, rescaled and it's plugged into this scalar wave equation. Uh, and uh, so that and and what you observe is that this is is pure. This is a gauge source function. So there is a there is a generalized harmonic gauge which sets that right hand side to zero and and. What you have then is and uh, in the if you restrict to Schwarzschild and you take uh, the imaginary part of this object, then this equation is known as the Reggie Wheeler equation. Uh, and, and so that was, uh, that paper was, uh, I mean, origi the original paper is from 1957, uh, but then I guess Price sort of wrote it in, in this more recognizable form. Uh, and, uh, but so this is the, the, this is, you might call this the generalized Okay, and uh, and so th this is another example of this principle that that here we have another um, uh, scalar wave equation that encodes in a, to a, in a certain sense the linearized gravity. So here, uh, so you can essentially pick one of these and and construct solutions of linearized gravity, or you can uh, or you can uh, look at uh, this. Scalar wave equation. Um, yeah. Yes. You get the you do get the Maxwell type equation. So it's a, it's a it's kind of a uh, and and so you so you can do this procedure. You can you can spin, take the linearized vial spinner, spin lower it, and and do a. And that gives uh, that gives you a Maxwell-like equation. Um, you re you, that can be rescaled then by powers of this zeta, and you can shift it so that it looks more like a, a Maxwell equation. And then you impose some gauge, and then you have the then you have essentially the Maxwell equation. So so this uh, this is a, an interesting procedure which I haven't 
fully explored, I have to say. But uh, I think that's, that's kind of intriguing because that, uh, because the Maxwell, if, if you have a Maxwell field, you have conservation laws and so on. So, so that's, uh, that's a kind of promising uh, uh, direction to think about. But, uh, but I haven't fully explored that. Uh, okay, so, um, so I think, so let me, let, let, let me break here and then uh, do, derive this uh, Tukolsky system. So th I'll derive this one or at least indicate how it's done uh, uh, next, uh, next hour. Okay. So what, what, I, what I plan to do uh, now is to uh, indicate how to derive uh, the Tukolsky system for one of the Maxwell scalars. And this will, this will not be, of course, in, in full detail, but at, at least you can see why this can work, so to speak. Uh, and so, so someone said that uh, it wasn't clear what my dot means. And, and so when I, write, uh, when I wrote uh, psi dot 2, for example, that means the linearized version of, of, of psi 2. So simply take, take the definition of psi 2 and, and differentiate it along the, the one parameter family. And this one parameter family also includes then a one parameter family of tetrads. This is very important to understand and, and, and it's, a, it's a serious complication if you decide to use these techniques. You, you introduce more gauge freedom that you then have to control. So the, the gain is that you have also now more gauge source functions to play with. And as I said, uh, uh, I think the first lecture is that, that uh, if you set things up as a first order symmetric, symmetric hyperbolic system coming from, from the, the, the two Cartan structure equations and the Bianchi system, then the gauge source functions um, can be uh, defined in including as including functions of curvature, which is quite uh, a difference from the usual harmonic coordinate uh, setup. <coughs> so, so two of the uh, two of the Tukolsky equations uh, that involve. So, so I'm going to to only look at the phi phi naught. So the two equations that involve that field uh, are the following ones. Number them one and two, and remember that uh, that uh, there is this this uh, important uh, principle that these uh, these operators are weighted. Um, <coughs> so so Thorn has weight one one. Uh, and Thorn prime has weight one, minus one, minus one. So they, when you apply them, they change the type um, of, of the field. And, and, and uh, just schematically, so, so phi naught has type uh, two, zero. Phi one has type zero, zero. And uh, phi two has type minus two zero. Just uh, just to keep things confusing, uh, they have they get ordered like that, and and uh, certain people uh, insist that this is not a good notation. <laughs> but uh, let them let them have their opinions. Um, so so that means that if you're going to write 
uh, an equa a system of equations involving these fields, then, uh, then uh, and I, if I apply an operator to phi naught, for example, if I apply uh, f prime uh, uh, to phi naught, then uh, this has to end up uh, with a weight that's compatible with the operator acting on phi 1. So, so we have to have a diagram like this. So, so the only operator I can apply here would be the thorn. And you see that, uh, so here I, I have thorn phi 1, uh, and that is equal to something involving f prime on phi naught. So this, this is where equation 2 ends up. And, uh, and similarly, if I apply thorn prime, uh, thorn prime to phi naught, the only uh, compatible operation is, is f. And so, so this is where equation 1 ends up. And, and, and so, um, and now the, 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 so, so now you can continue that scheme and, and, and uh, apply further operators. And so if we, so if we make the following choice, so you apply thorn minus two rho minus rho bar to equation one, uh, minus f minus 2 to to equation 2, then that is equivalent. So, so let me say, so here I have I've written this, uh, here I've written this uh, in the type D case. So this is in type D. So there are several coefficients here which are which have been cancelled because we are in a type D background, and this this decoupling that that I'm talking about will not happen in a general space time. It requires you to be in an algebraically special space time, and 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 so it uh, I think it it basically only works in type D. Uh, and uh, so if if you just calculate this out. What you end up with is uh, can be shown to have the following form. And here, this is where so this can be expressed in terms of uh, of uh, basically. So what what's happening is uh, you take the the left hand side of this system, take the resulting expressions they turn out to be identical to this, this uh, Tchaikovsky operator. And this then is applied. So here I have built up a second order operator that's being applied to phi naught. And then uh, we use the, the Maxwell equation and apply the same first order operators as here, but on the right hand side. And, and uh, what that that can that result can be written in the following way. And so here is a commutator between these first order operators. And as I said, so uh, uh, there's a set of commutator identities that can be derived as part of this scheme. Uh, and if you apply, the, you, you apply those and calculate, you find that this is identically zero. So, so this means that, uh, so here we have used, and, and so this is, this is kind of miraculous in some sense because if you start from the Maxwell equation, uh, use uh, the, the apply one derivative, contract an index, and compute 
commute derivatives. It's it's not. It's it's very easy to see that you get a system which looks like a wave equation for for the Maxwell field strength, and of course that's going to have a potential term that that involves the curvature in the space time. But here, uh, something uh, a lot more remarkable has happened because we're getting a scalar equation from, uh, we're getting one single scalar equation from the, from the Maxwell system. And, and as I said, I mean, if you, you, uh, you apply the same argument using this spin lowering, and there you use in a, in a covariant manner the, the, the fact that you have a killing spinner, uh, you end up also with a decoupled scalar equation. Uh, so, 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 so here, what's what's important to note is is a scalar decoupled equation for phi naught, and this is uh, and 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 the procedure to derive all the other Tucholsky equations for for the extreme uh, scalars for linearized gravity and for Maxwell is the same. Um, and, and so I'm hiding a lot of comp computations, but this, I think the principle is more important. <coughs> uh, here, oh yeah, phi one. Yeah, so, so everything is organized so that we have only phi zero on the left hand side and only phi one on, on the right hand side. Okay, so, so this, 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 and, and uh, so I said that this works in general in type D. So in particular in Kerr and Schwarzschild, uh, this works. And, and I mean, this is, this is interesting, but there's a, there, it's not sufficiently interesting in, in a certain sense uh, to be really useful because uh, the, the Tukolsky system has another uh, remarkable property. And this was all, this was all uh, in, in, uh, derived in explicit coordinate computations by Tukolsky in 1972 or 1973. And I, so I heard the story that Tukolsky and uh, uh, Tukolsky, Fackerel, and Ipser were all at the same time postdocs with Kip Thorne, and he had sort of given them the task to look at, um, at, uh, at the extreme scalars and the middle scalars. And, and so Tukolsky came up with the Tukolsky system, Fackerel and Ipser came up with the Fackerel-Ipser equation. Um, and, uh, and the Tukolsky system has a remarkable property that the Fackerel-Ipser equation doesn't have, even though it's a it's an interesting uh, wave equation. It's not known to have, have the following property. And, uh, and this, is, this is somehow the most remarkable thing about the Tukolsky system. So uh, you can actually apply separation of variables, and and so, but this, so so then uh, in in the generalized Carnot, uh, so not in the in the general type D, but in this more restricted class where you actually have a killing tensor. Uh, then, then you can write uh, so here here is the Tukolsky system spin s uh, equation, and that can be written as as uh, Two pieces, uh, and and each piece commutes. So those 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 are two commuting operators. OK, 
Okay, so, so that means that I can use the eigenvalues, formally eigenvalues of this uh, operator here and, and, and use those as separation constants for the Tukolsky system. And, and, and this, with this rescaling, this, uh, this, this is the, the spin weighted the, uh, you can identify it in, in some sense with the spin weighted spheroidal Laplacian. So it, it's, an, it's, an, it's an operator that the, 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 the principal part of it looks something like a rescaled uh, uh, rescale version of this operator. Because remember that, that F is is built up from m times theta, and uh, and uh, so m contracted with theta. So this is this is the f operator, and uh, and and if we're in 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 the Kinnersley tetrad, in in Borlinquis coordinates, then. The, the explicit expression for M was, so I can, I can write it as, so it's R minus I A cosine theta, and then we have I A uh, sine theta. This is the T component, uh, zero, one, I over sine theta. And this, since this uh, this expression here, this is the this is this is the zeta, in that particular case. So this rescaling, what it, uh, this rescaling of of the of 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 the Tukolsky system, this scalar, this is this corresponds to the scalar sigma that appears in the metric form of the of the uh, Kerr line element. Uh, in the Borlinquist form of the curl line element, and and uh, and basically what what this rescaling does it it, re it removes a lot of angular dependence from the coefficients, and the same here, this rescaling uh, uh, sort of leaves over the uh, the simplest possible uh, coordinate form of the vector, right? So so these are kind kind of um, uh, the, the, the good, nice coordinate versions of these, uh, these operators. But this, this is all, uh, a, this is a covariant expression. <coughs> so so this, this operator here, in some sense, is what corresponds to the angular Laplacian in this game. And so it's the eigenvalues of, of that uh, sort of expression that uh, that one can use as separation constants in the Tukolsky system, and so so then if if you are able to expand things out in 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 modes and so on, uh, then um, then one might try to use similar techniques that work for the wave equation because the spin zero case of all of this is of course the the scalar wave equation. And, and, and so this, this separability of the Tukolsky system is, is a generalization of the separability properties of the wave equation uh, that, you have, that you have in the, in the curve space time. Okay, and, and so these, these, op these operators, R and S, are symmetry operators. So if you if you were in the lucky situation that you have actually a conserved energy, uh, then you could try to use 
um, these symmetry operators to, to build up higher order energies and so on and, and, and carry out this sort of scheme that I was talking about yesterday. Uh, but the problem with the Tukolsky system is that it's, it's spin weighted and, and uh, there is no known conserved stress energy or energy for that system. And the same with uh, the, the to call with the Fekker Lipser and the generalized Reggie Wheeler system, uh, those are wave equations with a complex potential, and there's no known conserved energy for either of those as well. And, and uh, for the Fekker Lipser, we have ways around that, but that, uh, that uses, the, you have to use information from the full Maxwell system to deal with that. And on the other hand, um, uh, in a mysterious way, the, the, so let me just say this in words. So in a mysterious way, the fekker lipser equation does know about the Maxwell system. It has a ground state, which is the, coming from the Coulomb uh, state of the Maxwell field. So since you're on a black hole background, uh, you have a non-trivial topology. Uh, you have basically R4 minus the cylinder, so you have non-trivial two spheres and you have, uh, that can carry a non-trivial Maxwell field. And in the Kerr or Schwarzschild case, this is the Coulomb field. Uh, it has an explicit expression uh, which is proportional to the killing spinner. So this, th there's a particular Maxwell field which is proportional, so as in the spinner form, it's proportional to the killing spinner and uh, the middle scalar of that Maxwell field is, is a bound state for the fekker lipser equation. And there is, so there is something, some, some piece of information there that's missing. And numerical uh, experiments show that uh, this bound state is stable. So, and and you, can, you can argue that this is the case as well, but, uh, but uh, I, I don't know how to actually prove any of those. Um, uh, this uh, dispersion property for the Fekker Lipser, but uh, okay, and 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 so the same with with Tukolsky. Tukolsky is an extremely beautiful system of equations, but uh, which has these all these remarkable properties. It knows about all the properties of linear gravity, but uh, the problem of actually doing estimates for the Tukolsky system is, is quite wide open. And uh, there's, the, there's this remarkable result by Whiting, uh, which says that, uh, that separated modes are stable in a certain sense. And that also applies to the, to the non-zero spin case. Uh, but but that's, that's, from an analytical point of view, that's more or less the only information that, that is available. So I think that's, that's a very interesting uh, and open problem. <clears throat> so uh, uh, as I said, so these, these, uh, these operators are symmetry operators for the, uh, for the Tukolsky system. And, and uh, at least for the, for the Maxwell field, uh, it's it can be quite well understood where those operators are coming from because uh, we can classify all symmetry operators for the Maxwell field. Um, and so let me explain how that goes.
And so this, uh, this can be done in quite a general context, uh, only assuming existence of certain uh, killing spinners. Uh, and and uh, what I'm going to be talking about applies in particular in the Kerr case, and there it's been known uh, for since the since the 80s at least. Uh, I mean this this was in some sense known or found by Tukolsky by doing explicit coordinate computations uh, in 1972 or something like that. Uh, but then the covariant version of this was was done in Kerr. In the in the 1980s, and um, and uh, but it can actually be done in in, in complete um, generality, just assuming a, a killing spinner with certain properties. Uh, and so, for example, in Kerr-Newman, the same. If you go from Kerr to Kerr-Newman, then then you also have these uh, symmetry operators uh, that I'm, that I'll be talking about. Uh, so. So, so, so the Maxwell equation comes in two versions. Depending on, on the helicity of, of the field, uh, so that means to say whether uh, the field has primed or unprimed indices. Um, <clears throat> so in this, so in, in the spinner setting, we have these two uh, versions of the Maxwell equation. Uh, and so now, a, a, so a symmetry operator, uh, So in general, that's something that should take solutions to solutions. But since we have, it's natural to think about two different types of, of Maxwell equations. So the, there are really two types. Uh, so there's the first kind. Uh, And there's a second kind. Uh, which takes uh, left to right. And, um, and so I'm, I'm not going to, so this, this, this one would go, this one would take sort of phi, uh, phi zero to, to something involving, um, to let's say chi zero, and this would this would take phi zero to something like chi bar two. This is this is the sort of thing that or or to chi two. So this is the sort of thing that th this 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 would if we look at components of such such an operator, what it's trying to do is to is to is to map from one type of component to the same type of, of component in a, new max, in a new Maxwell field. Here, this, ma this maps between components with different spin weights. And uh, so this is, oh, both, are, both are important, but I'm going to uh, only talk about those. But all of these, all of these operators can be classified. And, and so the, the, the general result that you can prove is, uh, so one, one general result that you can prove is the following. Uh, so if we have a vacuum And we have a, a, a kappa a b, which is a killing spinner of valence two zero. Uh, then,
or Maxwell. And uh, so I can actually write that down. Um, so, so here, uh, okay, so now there is a conflict of notation. So here is another object called uh, capital theta. This is, this time it's a spinner, and this is, uh, so it's constructed from the, the Maxwell field and the killing spinner. So it's a contraction of, of the Maxwell field and the killing spinner. And what this, what this uh, actually does is that it projects out, out the phi 0 and phi 2. So this depends only on the extreme components of the Maxwell field because of the fact that the kappa has this form. So kappa contains the principal spinners, uh, uh, and and when you when you make this contraction, you see that, and you expand out the phi, in terms of its components, which are spinners, multiplying uh, combinations, which are either iota 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 a om, om, omicron iota or omicron omicron, and when you do these contractions and use the fact that omicron contracted with itself and iota contracted with itself vanish, then you can figure out that this only contains these extreme uh, spin components. So this is somehow a covariant way of projecting out those extreme uh, spin components. And then uh, we can write down the following one form. So, uh, of course, I mean, this is impossible to, to really uh, grasp, but I'm just indicating that this is, uh, the complexity of these expressions is manageable. So this is this is a, a one form, and and then uh, the symmetry operator, that, which we might call L, is takes phi to chi, which is defined as um, Like that. So, uh, from the Maxwell field, for, we form this this spinner, which projects out the extreme components. Uh, multiply again by the the killing spinner. Apply a derivative uh, that gives a first order expression in the in the Maxwell field. Apply another derivative uh, in 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 this form um, and. This is, so this is actually the, the curl of A in, in this, uh, in this uh, no, notation that I used. And, and this then can be checked to solve the, the Maxwell equation. So, so this, is, this is an example of, of quite a general construction uh, uh, that is deeply related to the fact that, that the Tukolsky system is separable. And it's actually the covariant, this, this, the fact that this uh, operator is, is a symmetry operator for the Maxwell system in the sense that it takes solutions to solutions. This is, the, this is a covariant manifestation of the fact that, that the Tukolsky system is separable. So this is somehow, uh, and, and um, and uh, so I'm, I'm convinced uh, that, that it's, it's possible to understand uh, in, in a similar way, and people have actually tried uh, uh, to understand in a similar way the, the, the nature of the, 
separability of the Tchaikovsky system for the spin two case, so linearized gravity. But uh, that is just, uh, I mean, exponentially more complicated. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think it's not been, it's not really straightened out. <coughs> uh, but I, I'm convinced that can be done, and I think it's an important problem. <coughs> And and so the uh, so the remark here is that is that the projection of this operator L on on uh, spin weight plus minus one. So that's uh, uh, For for the for the, for for the s equal to one, so so uh, Maxwell version of uh, Tchaikovsky. So that can be checked, uh, and and so so the remarkable fact is that uh, is that the uh, it, it's it's more or less true that that the 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 extreme components of this operator decouple. That's a remarkable fact, but the middle component does not decouple, and that's behind the fact that the the factor ellipser, if that did actually decouple, that would mean that the the, the factor ellipser equation would also be separable, and we would be uh, this would be extremely nice, but it it doesn't seem to be the case, so there's a mystery there. Um. <coughs> Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so that's that's one remark. So the other remark is the is the following. So this A, uh, which is constructed uh, by taking one derivative of the um, of the Maxwell field, uh, it actually solves this this Uh, so this this was the curl, uh, but if I apply the curl dagger, uh, and and this is uh, this is simply this. Uh, so there are many a's. I apologize for that, but I think you can distinguish them. Uh, so, uh, so here, here we take here we contract the primed index and symmetrize, and that gives this Maxwell field. If I take a covariant derivative, contract, contract the unprimed index and symmetrize, I get zero. So th this uh, this construction immediately gives a solution of this curl dagger equation and uh, and this this is the adjoint of the maxwell equation so i, I think i misspoke uh, when i when i first introduced when i first introduced those curl and curl dagger i said they're formal adjoints they're not i mean they're formally self adjoint each of them and and uh, in a certain sense, and and uh, and I also mixed up the convention for the curl and the curl dagger. But this is this is the right convention, and uh, and so the the Maxwell equation is also a curl dagger uh, equation, and uh, uh, 
So if we, we can just calculate uh, So this is this is the operation that you would. So uh, this is zero. This 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 is zero if if phi is a Maxwell field. That has test, takes one derivative to contract the, an unprimed index. And uh, then uh, if we do a partial integration, then I get. Something like that, and but now phi is sym symmetric. So what, here I have a contraction of, of primed index, and uh, and these unprimed indices will be sym will be uh, contracted over. So so I, here I have. Like that. So, so you see that this this op differential operator that I have here, this is really the formal adjoint of the Maxwell equa Maxwell operator, and uh, and this has a very interesting consequence. Uh, the so we have symmetry operators. They they express in some sense. So the eigenvalues of a symmetry operator can be thought of in some sense as as uh, conserved quantities. And, uh, and this symmetry operator arises from a potential which satisfies the adjoint Maxwell equation. And uh, uh, so you can observe that um, um, you can observe the following that uh, if we have a so let's let's call this the adjoint equation. Uh, so so okay so so this this is actually the 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 complex conjugate. Of the equation that uh, well no it's it's the same it's the same yeah sorry uh, so um, okay so so in this calculation you need to apply uh, in this in this calculation you need to apply a complex conjugate to one of the fields to end up with this one yeah. So this this is uh, so this is uh, so I was I was uh, leaving out a, a complex conjugate, but if you take a complex conjugate of this, that flips the prime to the, with the unprimed indices, and you end up with this one. Okay. Uh, so let's let's call this the adjoint equation. <coughs> And uh, what you observe then, and so uh, so let phi so we take a solution of the Maxwell equation. Suppose we have a solution of, of the uh, of the adjoint equation. Then uh, what you find is that this one form. So if I take take a solution of the adjoint equation, take its complex conjugate, contract with the Maxwell field, that gives me a one form, and that one form is conserved. So that means that this holds. Uh, so that so that means that uh, uh, that this one form gives a flux 
defined from the uh, Maxwell field, which is conserved. And so if we can manage to construct such one forms, such uh, solutions of the adjoint equation, which, so now what we would like to do is to construct solutions of the adjoint equation, which are uh, covariant expressions in, in the and so on. So, so, so if, we, if we're able to construct interesting such um, solutions of the adjoint equation, we can construct interesting conserved currents and from that get interesting uh, uh, energy estimates or energy identities for the Maxwell field. And in particular, you can get higher order uh, uh, energy identities. And, and so as I, as I pointed out, so one, one example of such a current is already, uh, was already uh, given because uh, that comes up as part of the construction of this uh, symmetry operator. So that, that's one example of a non-trivial current that we already uh, know about, so to speak. <clears throat> so as an, uh, as an example of uh, I mean, the most basic example is take the, the, this is the Maxwell stress energy. So it's just phi phi bar. Uh, and uh, if we take uh, uh, if we take the P by, by setting So we take a vector field, uh, contract it into the Maxwell field. Then if this is killing, so, so then, then this, um, this the, co the corresponding G, J, this is just T, A, B, Psi, B. So this, this, is, the, this is the stress. So this is simply the, the stress current that I get uh, by, by choosing uh, this particular solution. And this will be a solution of the adjoint equation if, uh, if psi is a killing field. So this, this solves the, the adjoint equation if psi is a killing field. And therefore, this current, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, which is got by this is the same as taking the p bar uh, like that. Uh, so if I take this definition, uh, that gives me back the usual stress current. OK. Uh, so that, that's, that's not so interesting. But uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, so, uh, so let me give uh, let me give one uh, one example of such uh, 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 construction. So here is another. Uh, well. Let, let me not let me not do that. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Let. Uh, okay. Let, let me write one one thing down. Uh, uh, so well. So so I'll, I'll just say it in words because I don't have so much time. So uh, so the story is the following: that uh, uh, originally. Uh, in Maxwell theory, you have, if you look at Maxwell theory on Minkowski space, you have uh, the stress energy and its associated cons conserved quantities uh, that you can define from the conformal killing fields of Minkowski space. So there is a 15 dimensional space of conformal killing fields on Minkowski space. And since the, the Maxwell stress energy is trace free, 
uh, those all give conserved currents. Uh, but um, uh, there is also the phase, uh, the, the, the phase rotation symmetry of the Maxwell field. That gives another set of, of uh, conserved currents. Uh, the, the Minkowski space admits a 20-dimensional space of killing spinners. And uh, by using constructions along the lines of this, um, uh, so essentially, using constructions along the lines of this potential A that I wrote down, you can, you can get new higher order uh, conservation laws for, for, the, for the Maxwell field on Minkowski space. And, and uh, these include uh, Lipkin's Zilch, <laughs> Zilch current and, and um, other chiral currents which were discovered in the 1960s. And, and the remarkable fact is that all of these, all of, all of these basic constructions, uh, due to the, the presence of the killing spinner on, on, on the curve space time, carry over to the curve space time. So, uh, so the, the generalization of these results by uh, Lipkin and, and uh, Fushich and Nikitin and so on, they, are, they can be quite easily generalized to the curve space time. And uh, one of the currents, uh, uh, since, since this A that I wrote down uh, solves the adjoint equation, that gives a, a chiral current for the Maxwell field. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that's, that's quite interesting. And I, 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 I'm not sure uh, really where that, uh, that story ends, so to speak. And, but <clears throat> so I, I want to say, uh, I want to finish by saying something, uh, uh, something related to this. And this is, so in, the, in this vein of constructing new conserved quantities, so one, uh, for, the, for the wave equation, uh, so we have, so for the wave equation, I explained that you can polarize the stress energy um, and get a bilinear expression in the field. You can plug in, in each slot, a symmetry operator and get new uh, conserved tensors. And, and uh, here you can do the same. So this is, essentially bi this is essentially quadratic in the Maxwell field. So I can polarize, plug in symmetry operators and get new conserved tensors and new conserved currents. And, uh, and an, an example of that, uh, which I think is, is interesting, is the following. So, uh, so the, there is this notion of equivalent currents. Uh, so if we have two currents, they're equivalent. If, uh, so th this simply means that these, the difference of these one forms is, a, is, a, is an exterior derivative. So this is, uh, and so that means that if I integrate these currents over, over, over a hypersurface, the difference is a boundary term, okay? So, so this, this means that the difference as, uh, from the point of view of an energy flux is trivial. Uh, and so now an example uh, of this type of construction. Uh, so we let chi So, so this is the this is the result of applying that symmetry operator um, uh, on that I that I explained on the on the Maxwell field. This gives a, a new Maxwell field chi, uh, and then uh, this. So let J be this current. Uh, 
So uh, we make it real by adding the complex conjugate. And then uh, uh, let This, uh, so this is a one form uh, that's defined by differentiating that expression theta, which is, which is the killing spinner contracted into the, the Maxwell field. So this gives a, an expression involving first derivatives of the Maxwell field. Uh, and uh, then can define, a, so this, this, this one form is, this is actually morally speaking, it's it's kappa, uh, kappa contracted with the, the killing field psi that's got by di divergence. Um, uh, no, sorry. So it's, it's, it's morally speaking, it's phi contracted with that killing field plus grad epsilon. That's what it is. So an epsilon is this uh, rescaled version of the middle scalar. So this is essentially the gradient of one of the scalar fields that appear uh, out, that you get by predicting uh, the, the Maxwell. Uh, and, and so we can then write down a symmetric two tensor like this. Okay, so this this is essentially the a kind of uh, super energy or stress energy type tensor constructed out of this one form. So this is con this is constructed in the same way that you construct the the usual stress energy tensor for the scalar field out of its gradient, and and the gradient of an important scalar field appears here. Uh, and and uh, so. And then there is a lower order correction term. So this is zeroth order, first order in derivative. And, and the remarkable thing is that uh, uh, for, first of all, these, this tensor is conserved. So this is a conserved stress energy tensor uh, defined at, at first order in derivatives in the Maxwell field. So the original, uh, uh, so, and it's also symmetric. And remember that the original TAB uh, for the Maxwell field is, is that. So, so this is zeroth order in derivatives. So the natural stress energy is zeroth order in derivatives. This is conserved, but it's at first order level in derivatives. And, and, uh, and the, the fact is that this, uh, if I take, uh, uh, this J current that I, I, I got by polarizing the stress energy inserting a second order symmetry operator for the, for the Maxwell field, contracting with the killing field, that, that, uh, that current is, is conserved. Uh, and it's actually equivalent to, uh, to this that we get by contracting this stress energy tensor with, with the killing field. So this, this produces, uh, no, I mean, so not, so not only is, is there, uh, do we have this from the construction of the symmetry operator, we get a conserved current, that's quite clear. But that current also, uh, basically after some partial integrations, you can see that it has dominant energy property. And so it, it can be expected to be useful for, for energy estimates. And, and, uh, and, uh, but we have this equivalence that it's actually secretly, this stress energy actually appears from the symmetry operator like that. Okay. 
Okay, so so I'm uh, so I, I, I like to thank you for your patience, and uh, and thanks for listening. So um, I think I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs>